I think there's a very real possibility that one of these coaches could cost their fighter in this massive fight. So stick around to the end of this video, guys, because I'm going to be dissecting the impact these trainers could have on their fighters. Anthony Joshua, Daniel Dubois, Ben Davison, Don Charles. Let's go. Hello everyone, welcome back to A Guy Called Henry. AJ Dubois fight, we're in the midst of it guys, and I'm trying to leave no angle uncovered, no stone unturned, to use that horrible old boxing cliche, but I am really trying to consider every angle when it comes to this fight. I don't want to get to the fight and then realize I, I, there was something that I didn't think that I should have talked about before it. And one element and one component of this fight that I actually think has a lot of narrative and is super interesting is the two coaches in this fight. Ben Davison, who coaches Anthony Joshua, and Don Charles, who coaches Daniel Dubois. They're completely different coaches, guys. They're complete opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of age, um, in terms of experience. And, you know, actually the experience potentially lies with the, with the coach that you might not expect. And I really think that whilst these coaches have very different attributes, it may be that they're actually the exact right guys for the fighters that they're with. But in this video, I really want to go through, I want to look at, you know, when, when did these coaches emerge? What is their style? What are some of the successes they've had so far? You know, what stage were the, the two men, Anthony Joshua and Daniel Dubois at when they teamed up with these guys? And how might their input impact the outcome of this fight? I really believe that a coach can have a huge bearing on a fighter's destiny. You know, it might be that a fighter is hugely talented, but it's untapped because they're not with the right man. Or maybe they're taking completely the wrong approach to things. And it's because the coach that they're with hasn't understood, you know, this isn't your typical man that I normally work with. This is someone who needs a specific treatment. I've seen it over and over again in gyms, guys, at lower levels, you know, where you go in and it's a one size fits all with the, co with the fighters that they coach. And I think that to be able to look at the man in front of you and get the best out of him is super important. And, it, you know, being adaptable as a coach um, is, is of the utmost importance. And I think that, you know, there's definitely different elements to coaching. One of those things is tactical. One of them is motivational. Um, and the other, the other is fitness. And, you know, those three things in my mind are the keys to, you know, unlocking performance on fight night. Guys, before I get into this one fully, please like the video, please subscribe to my channel and drop your thoughts in the comments section below. Which coach do you think it can have a bigger impact on this fight? What do you think of the work of the two men so far? And who do you think is going to win this fight, Anthony Joshua or Daniel Dubois? So to begin with, I just want to talk quickly about Ben Davison and how he sort of emerged on the scene. It was when Tyson Fury was making his comeback, I first heard of Ben Davison. And I heard he was working with this really young guy in the gym, Tyson Fury, and everyone was sort of very skeptical about it. They were like, Tyson Fury's what? He's like 30 stone. He's massively overweight. And now he's working with this unknown trainer, Ben Davison. And it was really when Fury went into that Wilder One fight and had that massive performance, it was sort of Ben's coming out party. Everybody was like, wow, this young guy's done a phenomenal job of getting Fury into some kind of shape, getting him motivated, getting him back in the ring. And I think it sort of led to this, this sort of misconception of Ben Davidson as a coach where, you know, he started being coined this boxer-sized Ben. It's something you see on social media a lot. It's sort of a dig at him that he doesn't really necessarily have a, an, an innate understanding of boxing tactics and boxing skill and that he's really just a fitness coach. We've come to learn that the complete opposite is true of him. And he's actually one of the world's up-and-coming phenomenal coaches. He's probably already, you know, and definitely right at the top of the game already. And he's only 28 years old, which is so impressive. So that was when I first heard of Ben Davison. Don Charles, on the other hand, is someone that I heard of because of his work with Derek Chisora. And I think that's what most people know him for. Don Charles is now 62 years old. So you've got guys that are the best part of sort of 30 odd years apart in age. And ironically, I'm going to go into it, but you're going to see that Ben Davison is actually the one who has far more experience at the higher level than Don Charles. And I think that might play a big factor in this fight, but we'll get to that in a little while. We're going to start with Anthony Joshua and his background with coaches and his sort of journey with coaches because it was a massive talking point for a while, especially after the losses that he took. AJ obviously came through the amateur setup in Team GB where he worked with Rob McCracken. He runs the setup there in Sheffield. And when he turned pro, I actually remember he started off with Tony Sims because I believe, I think, it was, I think an Olympic cycle was coming up or something and... Um, or well, there was some sort of amateur tournament coming up that meant Rob McCracken wasn't available to work with him right off the bat. But I think he always intended to work with Rob. And, you know, the speed that they managed to get AJ up to scratch, you know, that team, phenomenal. You know, the work they did with him was really good because AJ was a latecomer to boxing. And so the work that they were able to do to get him up to speed, to get him to become a top level heavyweight as quickly as they did was really, really impressive. Um, but, you know, cracks started to show um, after that loss to Andrew Ruiz in the first fight. They came back... And I think he, that was when he added Angel Fernandez to his camp. And this is when things started to get a little bit muddled. Now, it may have been before then, but this is, to my knowledge, officially, that was when Anthony Joshua brought Angel Fernandez into his setup. And you sort of had more than one coach, which 
that's when you start talking, are oh, there too many cooks in the kitchen? You know, it's that old saying, too many cooks spoil the broth. And for that fight, it got the job done. You know, I think he felt that he needed to move more. And we saw that he, he went in the ring and it was a much more apprehensive, much more cautious performance. Used his legs, stayed on the outside, used long shots. And he didn't really get it, mix it up with, with Ruiz too much in that fight. And I think that was the reason that he brought Angel Fernandez on board. Um, and obviously it worked. But the problem after that was that we then saw AJ caught between a couple of different styles. And this has been talked about a lot. So I just want to give a quick overview of this. But for sure, there was a period of time where people were sort of like, what is Anthony Joshua now? And I think Anthony Joshua didn't know himself. He didn't know how to go about his work. What was the way for him to move forward? I definitely think he became much more reserved after that Klitschko one fight anyway. But then getting knocked out, um, stopped against Ruiz in that first fight, just solidified that sort of feeling I think he had that he didn't really want to put himself in harm's way. He wanted to box his opponents more. But then the problem was that it didn't play into his greatest attributes and strengths, which was speed and power. He then had the two fights against Usyk. Uh, well, the first one in particular, where um, Rob McCracken's corner work was heavily criticized. Um, you know, I, and I can remember hearing it myself. People, it's sort of saying to AJ, look, AJ, you know, you can do this, AJ, sort of encouraging him and, and saying, come on, AJ, you're, do you're boxing his head off. You're doing so well. When it just wasn't the case, he was losing and someone really... To my, to my mind, needed to put a rocket up AJ's ass and say, look, mate, you're down. You've got to go and knock this guy out and, and drive him on, you know, um, which, look, we don't know the reasons for that. Perhaps AJ at that time had a very fragile, uh, fragile mental state that meant he needed to be constantly built up and um, encouraged. So perhaps that would have, you know, they knew him better than anybody. They were in the gym with him every day. So they definitely got a lot of stick for that. And, you know, lo and behold, after that performance, AJ went and found a new trainer. Now, I almost completely forgot that for that second Usyk fight, he had Robert Garcia in his corner, Anthony Joshua. And I almost completely forgot about it. You know, it was such a, a random link up. I mean, I thought I actually really liked it at the time, you know, Robert Garcia, known for fighters that have that come forward Mexican style. I thought it would have worked really well. And he did put in a better performance in that fight, AJ. And they worked together for a very short amount of time. I think Angel Fernandez was still in and around the camp. I think he was someone that was always there with AJ as a, as a common thread throughout his career. I think I don't. I think he did some work with him even before he officially joined the camp, but I believe he was still on board then. Um, and it definitely felt like AJ was still running the show, and you didn't feel like you didn't feel like he had full control, Garcia. So there was that one fight they did that together. It went okay, um, and then he moved on to um, Derek James, who obviously known for coaching Errol Spence Jr. in particular. And they had an okay link up, but again, AJ still looked caught between styles. Um, he had the fights against Jermaine Franklin and Robert Hellenius, which AJ got the win in both of them. But again, you know, there were still concerns and doubts over AJ in those fights. You know, they, he still looked caught between styles. Um, in, that, in that Franklin fight in particular, probably a quite a difficult comeback fight for AJ, to be honest with you. I think his profile, where he's quite short and stocky, AJ's always had more problems, in, to my mind, against smaller fighters and in terms of height. Um, and then the Hellenius fight, you know, he actually got hit quite a bit in that fight, Joshua, more than you would have liked. Again, still a little bit caught between styles. Did see him really committing and punching through the target there, which was a great thing, but he got his nose bust up. Um, and it's this point where Anthony Joshua decides, I'm going to join Ben Davison. I think it was just a happy coincidence. I've heard them talk about it quite a bit. AJ was in the area. One of his mates said, why don't you just go and work out with Ben while you're out of camp? Just go there, tick over. And I think that he saw the way that Ben Davison and Lee Wiley were doing things. And he thought, you know what? I'll have a bit of this. At this time, the main thing that AJ was lacking was the ability to punch through the target. He, was, he still seemed apprehensive. He still seemed too afraid to get hit. Um, and just generally, his style seemed quite confused. You know, people were like, does this guy have the desire anymore? Does he have the hunger? Is he willing to put himself in harm's way? Because ultimately, as a fighter, if you're going to win fights, you are going to have to take those chances. You are going to have to take those risks, especially when your main attribute is knockout power. So that's where we find Anthony Joshua when he meets Ben Davison. I'm now going to get into Daniel Dubois and his journey before I then talk about the credentials of these two trainers and what I think they've added to the men that they now work with. So Daniel Dubois, when he turned over, um, he worked with Martin Bowers initially. And I believe it was up until the Joe Joyce fight that they were working together. Now that fight for Daniel Dubois was um, a bit of a disaster because, you know, I think Dubois was a fairly heavy favorite in that fight. Joe Joyce... Although a great amateur, you know, in the pro ring, people weren't that impressed by his body of work just because he looked so hittable and everyone was like, wow, Dubois, Dubois can really crack. But it was in that fight we saw um, mental fragilities in Daniel Dubois. Now look, fair play, I would not keep fighting. Most people would not keep fighting if they had a broken orbital bone. Allegedly, he had a broken orbital, bo orbital bone. Um, and he was losing the fight, Dubois. I think he was up on the cards, potentially. To my mind, he was losing on points. I think he was up on the cards. Regardless, he pulled himself out of that fight, Dubois. He decided he didn't want to continue. 
And that's one thing you'll say about Daniel Dubois. I've never actually seen him knocked out cold. I've only ever seen him decide he doesn't want any more, any more punishment in the ring. And that's when those mental cracks started to show. That's when he started being called a quitter, when people sort of said, does he really have the mindset and the minerals for this boxing game, especially at heavyweight? You know, you're going to get hit very, very hard. So that was always a concern for people. Now, now is when it gets a bit confusing because, you know, AJ was always criticized for jumping around trainers, but Dubois had a similar journey in terms of, you know, the consistency he's had with coaches. So he then joins Mark Tibbs. And this is where a component emerges in Daniel Dubois that I think we really need to consider. And um, that was that I think they didn't, I, from what I understand and what I remember, I don't think they ever actually had a fight together. He joined Mark Tibbs. And then I remember Mark Tibbs coming out and basically saying, I'm not going to be working with Daniel moving forward. His dad has too much influence and his dad has too much of a voice. And of course, you know, to this day, Daniel Dubois' dad is still in the camp. That's something I'm going to get to a bit later in the video. So stick around, guys, because I think that could be a crucial component in this fight in both positive and negative ways. So he leaves Mark Tibbs and he joins Shane McGuigan. And this is when you start to see Dubois get into a bit of a rhythm. He starts to win consecutive fights and he's looking much improved as a fighter. I mean, there, there were moments, it was kind of up and down. A lot of the problem that Dubois had with his development in this period was he was getting a lot of pretty quick knockouts. Uh, Bogdan Dinu, second round knockout. Kusumano, first round knockout. Trevor Bryan, fourth round knockout. And Kevin Lorena, um, third round knockout. And I believe it was the Lorena fight where Dubois actually had an ankle injury as well. So there was... You know, there was all sorts of reasons why it was a bit of a challenging time under Shane McGuigan in terms of his development. But what I will say is that you would say that Shane McGuigan <clears throat> is a young, world-class coach. I think actually kind of similar to Ben Davison. He's someone that you've seen get really top performances out of his fighters. I, I rate him really, really highly, and I think he's a great coach. So when he left Shane McGuigan, I was quite concerned about Dubois. I thought, you know what, I don't think that's the right move. Um, the reason for their departure, as I understand it, and I've read now, because um, I, I don't remember if I knew why at the time, but basically, um, apparently Dubois had some internal family issues. And look, I, guys, you, if you know me by now, you'll realize that I don't like talking about boxing politics, personal life, all this kind of thing, unless it relates to performance. And the only reason I'm bringing this up is because, just to give us context around this, the fact that with Dubois, there does seem to be a lot more... Um, uncertainty and instability than we might have realized and supposedly I think uh, well I know Shane McGuigan trains Caroline his sister and apparently there was some kind of family feud I don't know what it was I honestly don't care but worth mentioning because it's part of this narrative and part of this journey so at this point Daniel Dubois links up with his now trainer Don Charles and he has his fight against Usyk which you know I'm not going to start commenting on how that fight went I don't think it was that competitive I think Usyk won well but look Dubois did himself proud in that fight I thought he did well but again those mental cracks were there. Um, he quit on his, you know, he didn't get up. He could have got up. I don't think that's too debatable. He wasn't super hurt, but he just decided he had enough once again. And I believe that was his first fight with Don Charles. Um, and look, you know, hard to judge Don's performance as a coach on that performance because it's against the number one heavyweight in the world, probably the number one fighter in the world. And, you know, he's had to change trainers right before the fight. So it's very challenging as a fighter to switch trainers, um, you know, in, in such as important circumstances without any lead up time, without getting used to each other. Definitely a very challenging experience. So it's from this point that I really want to say their relationship together began. So when Daniel Dubois began with Don Charles, the things that he really needed... I mean, the number one thing for him, and it's always been the number one thing for him, is getting his mind right. Um, showing that he can go through tough times in the ring. That's something he really needed. In terms of his technical ability, the main fight where we saw it, I think we saw it in the Lorena fight also, to be fair. I believe it was the Lorena fight. But Dubois has had a very leaky defense. And it's something I showed you in my technical breakdown. Um, the Joe Joyce fight in particular, you know, ate so many jabs to the point where, his, as I say, his eye socket allegedly broke. And other fights as well. He's eaten some big shots. And, you know, that defense has been something that's a problem for him. It's technically something he needs to improve. He's had a lot of good tools, Dubois, for a long time. He's always been a touted young heavyweight. But for sure, there's some technical sharpening that's needed. Not only that, but I think that, you know, he he needed to learn how to use his jab more effectively. And I think that um, just setting up his shots in general is just something he needed a bit of help and a bit of work on. So in understanding how these coaches are right for these two men or were right for these two men, um, I just want to go through some of the achievements that they've had to date. I want us to understand the profile of these two coaches. So I'll start with Ben Davison. Um, and his success at the top of, the, of world boxing has been there for all to see. I'm going to go through the sort of significant fights they've had in terms of <clears throat> what titles have been on the line. So Ben Davison, you know, had that first fight with Tyson Fury for the WBC heavyweight title. It was a draw. 
Most people felt Fury should have won. We all know the context of that, where Fury was nowhere near fully fit. Um, and it was a really, really great performance. And Ben Davison did a good job there. Um, he obviously worked with Josh Taylor. Now, Josh Taylor, obviously not a um, not a fight that Davison's brought through, but more one he was able to sort of refine. Um, you know, Taylor was already an established champion at that point. He was... Um, he, he was absolutely fantastic. He'd come through under Shane McGuigan. Uh, and, and, you know, Taylor, he developed his style at that point. So all that you're, you can really do in that, that situation, is, if you're Ben Davison, is just try and add little ingredients to his game. So yeah, having that win against Ramirez on, for Taylor, um, you know, w was great. It was a unification of the whole division. And obviously there's huge pressure in that scenario. So that's an amazing experience as a coach to be right at the top of the game like that. Some of the work that Davison's most revered for is his work with Lee Wood, because Lee Wood was kind of, nowhere to be seen on the world scene he wasn't deemed to be a world level fighter and then um he he got him and, he, and i remember davison talking about him and saying you know he'd been this regarded as this sort of slick fighter from the ingle gym i took him on the pads and i just couldn't believe his power and so they developed his style around that they refined his style and technique to be more of a power puncher so he won against zucan he won the wba featherweight title which he then lost against um Maurizio lara which was you know i think that's probably his first lost in a world title fight, Ben Davison, where he's the main trainer, but then they avenged it. And that was the thing. They came back and they got Laura, uh, they got uh, Lee Wood to a point where he boxed an absolute perfect performance. So absolutely incredible. Um, he's also been involved with Billy Joe Saunders when he was in the corner for Can the Canelo fight. Wasn't the main co uh, trainer in the corner, but he was involved for that one. And he's been involved with Devin Haney, I believe. So I don't know how much he was involved, but there was talk about it. Um, so, you know, he, he uh, recently has been very, very involved with some significant fighters in big world title fights, in unifications, all that kind of stuff. Um, Don Charles, on the other hand, as I say, best known for his work with Derek Chisora. Uh, they had one world title fight, which they lost against Vitaly Klitschko. Um, the other world title fight that he had was with Frank Buglioni against Fedor Trudinov, which they lost. Um, and, th and those are the only fights he's had at world level. Most of his um, coaching has been at British level um, and some European level as well, I believe. So in terms of experience at the top level, ironically, even though there's nearly 30, there's actually more than 30 years between the two of them in age, it's actually Ben Davison who's got that world championship experience in abundance. Now, I spoke a bit before about what each fighter needed um, when they came to these two coaches. And so I just want to gauge here how much of a difference they've actually been able to make to the two fighters in terms of, you know, are these the right coaches for them and, you know, what impact is this going to have on the outcome of this fight? Um, firstly, I just want to give a bit of context to those those two lists I've just given you there. I, I think, you know, whilst it's clear that Ben Davison's got the much bigger accolades as a coach, um, and that's something we need to talk about with Don Charles, it's something that may influence this, the outcome of this fight, is his uh, desire to become someone who's coached the world champion. So whilst Ben Davison has actually had the better talents on paper, what I would say is that, um, you know, it doesn't mean that if you didn't give Don the same fighters that he wouldn't have achieved the, achieved the same things. Just because he's not had them, we're just not going to know, basically. But then also, I think it's telling that those talents have never chosen to go with a Don Charles. That might just be a perception thing. But, you know, these guys work with him in the gym. They're going to know if they like the way he does things and whatnot. So I think there's something we can read into that. I think that Ben is someone that fights see as a, a, a modern coach who's doing really impressive stuff, whereas Don, maybe he's a little bit too old school. I think when you look at the two fighters and how they've developed in their performances under these coaches, with Ben, Joshua's only had two performances and same with Dubois under Don Charles, he's only had two performances. So for Joshua, it's been the Otto Wallen fight and the Francis Ngannou fight. Because of the level of these uh, fighters, because of the context of these fighters, it's very hard to judge um, the impact of Ben Davison. I could only judge it based on what I saw Joshua doing in there in terms of how he went about the job. And what I'd say is that Ben and Lee Wiley, the team they've got there, you know, they are very, very analytical, very, very good at breaking down game film and working out what you need to do against an opponent. Not only that, but breaking down their own fights and figuring out how should I get this man to go about their work? What's the best way for this person to use the tools and attributes that they have? And I think it's clear to me that they've decided the best way for Anthony Joshua to box is as a counterpuncher. Genius to me, because it was something that AJ was always good at, but it was never his predominant style. I've broken all of this down in my breakdown video, guys. You can go and see the Ngannou performance in that video and what he did technically that made it so good on a, on a detail level. But just speaking generally here, they've made him into a counterpuncher. Like, that's his predominant style now. They've identified that that's the best way for him to go about his work. And he's had two phenomenal counterpunching performances where he's barely taken a punch. The context with the Wallen fight that makes it difficult to judge is that I think, from what I understand, Joshua's had a lot of experience sparring against Wallen and he's often dominated him. 
Um, so it was a fight he would have been really confident going into anyway. So stylistically, yes, you can see the counter-punching performance there. But in terms of have they given him confidence, have they improved him mentally, he may have been confident for that one anyway. I don't think having them there hurt though. Similarly with the Ngannou fight, we don't, we still don't actually know how good Ngannou is. What we do know is the only other boxing match he had was against Tyson Fury, who maybe wasn't fit. So much context here to understand, guys, but anyway, who maybe wasn't fit. But Ngannou arguably won that fight. If not, became very, very close to doing so. We know he knocked Fury down. So we have to take that as what it is. You know, Ngannou could be really, really bad, or he might be really decent. I think he's probably a top 25 heavyweight. That's probably how I view him. I don't think he'd make the top 10. Outside of that, it's hard to say. It's hard to say what he is. But again, the way that Joshua went about the job, super clean, you know, identified all Ngannou's tendencies early, knew exactly how to manipulate him, landed some monster punches and took him out clean. And it was a devastating performance. So from what we can see, perceivably, they've done a great job of Joshua, you know, because, you know, we've got to consider those intangibles and, and the context and everything, but we don't have anything that doesn't have all that context around it. So that's why this Dubois fight is so important to be able to say, yes, Joshua's back. Yes, he's now become a phenomenal counterpuncher. Yes, he's going to go and compete at world level against all the other top heavyweights. For Daniel Dubois, he's had the fights against Jarrell Miller and the fight against Hergovic with Don Charles. And in these two fights, you know, when we were talking before about what did, what did Daniel Dubois need to improve on, it was his mental fragility, it was his defense, it was his technique. In these two fights, for me, I think he's shown he's fixed half of his problem. The mental resilience is now there, for sure. I mean, he's willing to go to the well. And you saw it in these two fights because he had to. You know, he took a lot of shots. Even against Jarrell Miller, he ate some huge punches. And not only that, but... When he could have coasted to a points win at the end of that fight, he put his foot on the gas pedal and went, nah, I'm going to stop this guy. I'm going to knock him out. Same thing against Hergovic. You know, he really was getting battered in that fight, to my mind. He was getting beaten around the ring, um, eating the punches, yes. But, you know, if, um, for my, to my money, um, you know, Hergovic was well up on the cards. He was winning by a considerable margin by a number of rounds. And, you know, Dubois, the reason he won that fight was because he made it a war of attrition. He got his head down. He bit down on his gum shield. Stuck his head in there a few times, which isn't great. But, you know, you do what you need to do if the referee doesn't stop you. And he got in there and he smashed him up. Um, outworked him, overpowered him, and eventually the fight got stopped on cuts. So, incredible mental resilience from Dubois on display in both of those fights. In particular, the second one. So, that's great. But the other half of the issue being his defense has been leaky and poor. Um, for me, that's not improved. And to be honest with you, um, it's as leaky as it's ever been. You know, you saw against Hergovic, he ate so many right hands. And as I say, even against Miller, he ate some shots. So I personally believe that technically, I don't think Dubois really improved that much. I think that with the skills, with the skill set that he's got, with the tools that he's got, he could find much more comfortable ways of getting through the fights against the, the two, two opponents he just had. I think there was a more comfortable route to victory against both of them, where he didn't take as many punches, um, where he took them out probably a bit quicker and a bit more effectively. I think he's got so many great tools, you know, great jab, great feet. But I just think he doesn't always use things at the right moment. And in the end, in both of those fights, he, you know, he relied on resilience, um, which, you know, it's great that that's there now, but I still think technically he's lacking a little bit. Finally, I want to just kind of talk about, you know, what the camps are probably like now and how I think the coaches can have an impact on fight night. Now, with AJ, I think that he's going to have a really, really clear game plan for this fight because there's so many tendencies with Daniel Dubois to study and understand things that he's done throughout his career that he's done over and over again. I'm absolutely convinced that uh, Davison and Wiley will have come up with a great plan to beat Dubois and for AJ it's about execution. And with regards to AJ's weaknesses, we've now got a fighter in front of him that can put him to the test and we can really find out, you know, have these cracks been papered over or is AJ really, really back where we want him to be and actually in a better way than ever because he's got a really clear, effective style now for his attributes. That's what we're going to find out from Daniel Dubois because of the kind of pressure fighter that he is, because of the volume of output and all that sort of thing. So I think that Davison and Wiley are the best coaches available for Anthony Joshua. I think they're going to have him as well prepared as anybody could. And I think that the advice and insight they're going to be able to give him and the experience they have of these big championship fights will be completely invaluable for Joshua. So Joshua, for me, in terms of his team, he's in a phenomenal spot. I would call into question, however some of the things I've been seeing around Daniel Dubois, the relationship with Don Charles, and in particular, Daniel Dubois' dad. When family is involved in boxing, it's always, it's always a tricky thing because, you know, you're always going to have a more emotional relationship with your parents. There's been a lot of father and son trainers and it doesn't always work. There's been a few occasions where it has, you know, Floyd and Floyd Sr. is the first one that comes into your head. Um, 
I know that Sean Porter had a good relationship with his father, did great things together, but there's also a lot of examples of it not being the right thing. And now that his father's also in the corner, you just wonder, you know, to what extent is Don Charles actually in control of what Dubois does and in charge of this camp? Um, I know that, you know, it was, I think it was during the, um, the Miller fight that I think it was the first time that his dad was, was really actively involved in encouraging Dubois during the fight and it worked. So from a motivational standpoint, having his dad there is not necessarily a bad thing. But, you know, we've seen historically with Dubois, there's been issues within, you know, his family, in particular with Mark Tibbs, who said, you know, I'm not going to be undermined by the dad. And, you know, you do sort of wonder, is this a case of Don Charles being so desperate to finally have a world champion that he's willing to be undermined? He's willing, he's willing to accept that, um, that treatment. And I think even in some of the videos you've seen, you know, he has been a little bit dismissive, Dubois, of some of the things that Don Charles says. And, you know, you do just sort of wonder, is that a healthy dynamic for the camp? And actually, I've just seen as well, that Don Charles isn't there right now at the start of the, the, the fight week arrival. I'm not sure if Ben Davison was either. I've not seen him, but I know for a fact that Don Charles wasn't there because Dubois was asked about it. He was like, I don't know where he is. It doesn't matter. So you do sort of feel like it's him and his dad against the world. And then they've allowed Don to come in to an extent, but it's sort of like a man for hire kind of vibe rather than like we're actually integrated and we're all on the same page here. So that's interesting to me. Also, you know, based on what I've seen from Don Charles's body of work, I can't really find a performance in there. And for, guys, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I can't find a performance in there where it shows great tactical acumen. He's definitely someone that knows how to motivate his fighter and get them up for it. But I just question if he's a bit limited when it comes to boxing tactics and the nuances that you need to win at championship level. So I'm concerned that he won't be correctly prepared for what Joshua does. I'm not too worried about his motivation because it seems like he gets enough from what he's got in his corner already, Dubois. I think he'll be there till the end. He seems like he's in a good place himself. Um, but I just wonder if he could come up a bit short. The final thing I just want to question is, you know, I've, I watched an interview with Don Charles where he, you know, you can tell he's dying to have a world champion. You can see that's something that's really, really important to him. He's never quite managed to do it. He's had this long career, but never coached a world champion. And you just wonder, is having such a strong feeling about that potentially going to compromise Daniel Dubois' chances in this fight. I'm going to say no. I don't think it will. I don't think it's necessarily a problem, him having huge desire for that. It just means he's going to work a bit harder. Um, but I think that he might be compromising on some of his beliefs as a result of that, just because of the strange dynamic in camp that they seem to have. Um, it, it might not be the best thing, but equally, you know, the only thing you would say is, would someone who was that desperate to win a world title potentially have put their fighter at risk? I don't see that being an issue at all because one, he's experienced. He, I'm sure he cares about Dubois. He knows that's part of the job as a trainer, but two, the dad's there. So you know that stuff's not gonna, that's not gonna happen. So guys, overall, I think that AJ's got the more solid camp. I think they, they suit him perfectly. I think they've managed to bring him through in the last couple of fights. And I think now is the real test. Now we're gonna really find out what Ben Davison's impact has been. And for Dubois, I think that this is probably the best he's looked so far in his career in terms of the wins he's managed to get, but there's still lots and lots of issues technically, whilst it, mentally it's all there now. So I think he's sort of solved 50% of the problem. And, you know, more cracks may show when the pressure's on like this. This is a huge, huge fight. So if there are any issues in the camp, they're going to come to fruition. Um, and overall, I, I give the edge to AJ in terms of the way he set his camp up. They both had to come through different, uh, working with different trainers, trying to find the right solution. I think Dubois' ultimate solution might be yet to come, but we will find out. Anyway, guys, please uh, subscribe to my channel if you've enjoyed this video. Give it a like. Get your comments in the comment section below. How do you analyze these two trainers? How do you analyze their influence and impact on these two fighters? And who do you think is going to win this fight? If you do want to book this one through my link below in the description, uh, if you want to book this fight with DAZN, uh, if you use my link, I get a little bit of the revenue, guys. If you're planning on doing it anyway, all I ask is that you use my link. I'll get a small percentage of, um, of your purchase. And it just means that you help support my channel, which I really, really appreciate. But other than that, guys, appreciate you sticking to the end of this one. And on to the next one.